may be seated. As the festival chaplain, it has been a great pleasure to plan this evening's worship service, and Sister Nola and I got to have a lot of creative conversations about what this might look like. We often open festivals with a love feast, but we knew we were just coming off a really big banquet, and we thought a love feast might feel a little redundant if everybody's feeling a little full. So we decided we would do something a little different, and uh, Paul Poiker's new book may undo everything I'm about to say, um, but the history and the received tradition is that following a time of great difficulty within the Heron Hoot community, the community gathered for a communion service. We are gathered in person for a music festival for the first time in a long time. As a musical community, we have been through a lot. And so we're glad to gather here this evening to celebrate Holy Communion. Once again, the history or the received tradition tells us that at that communion service, the Holy Spirit came down upon that community in a new and special way so that people were not ready to go home. But they continued their time of fellowship after that worship service. And that's what we're going to do tonight. So we are going to celebrate Holy Communion. And by the way, the Moravian Church does practice an open communion table. So for those of you who are Moravian by music, but not Moravian by denomination, if you hear Christ uh, call to this table, it is for you. And so after we celebrate Holy Communion, we will have our own kind of modified love feast. And what I'm going to invite you to do, uh, our last hymn, we will say a blessing in here. We'll get to that. We'll say a blessing in here. And then our last hymn is, Won't You Walk With Me, Jesus? And what I'm going to invite you to do is walk. Uh, if you'll go out that door, there will be Love Feast on the green. So I invite you to stay around and... I invite you as you're leaving or as you get outside to find someone you don't know, someone you haven't met yet, and get a chance to know that person as you continue to celebrate this service outside, where it may actually be cooler by the time we get there than it is in here right now. So welcome to this opening worship service. And we have several people who want to bring us greetings this evening, so I'm going to invite them to come forward at this point. Randy and Hank and uh, Carol, if you will please come forward, and we will hear greetings from them uh, before we then continue with our worship service. So welcome, everyone, to this, our opening communion and love feast service. Thank you, Riddick. My name is Carol Troutman Carr. I'm the provost at Moravian University. How many of you graduated from Moravian College or Moravian Theological Seminary? Welcome home. So nice to have you here. Anybody drive in from out of town? Just want to warn you, we're having a rash of issues with cars. I hope you locked up. People are throwing zucchinis into open cars. <laughs> In all seriousness, it's wonderful to be here with you today. As a Catholic, I am envious of how fully the Moravians sing, not just in full voice, with or without masks, but in four parts. But I think we all know that whether you're, Mora as Riddick said, whether you're Moravian by faith or Moravian through your connection to music, we find that connection to our Lord through music. It is a way that we commune with him and with each other. It's wonderful to be together with you in person after all of these years. We heard so much about how the poor athletes suffered during COVID. No one suffered more than the musicians. We are not musicians alone. We are musicians in community and in ensembles and together. And I'm so grateful to be able to be here welcoming you back to Bethlehem, back to the Moravian Music Festival on behalf of Moravian University now to this community and I wish you well over the next few days.
Welcome. We're glad you're here. You've traveled from Texas, Canada, Arizona, Florida, Indiana, the thumb of Mission, Michigan, and just about everywhere in between, and some are watching virtually. Whether you come as a professional or an amateur, I imagine that we're all here for the very same reason. Music has touched us profoundly. It has brought us closer to God and closer to each other. Many of you received this poster uh, in your bags. I have more, trying to get rid of them. <laughs> I've always liked this poster. To me, it represents an open invitation to all. Gwen, being the professional that she is, immediately recognized it as a common German song sung at Christmas time. My daughter-in-law, being as loving as she is, observed that all the children are happy and enjoying what they're doing. I offer you this invitation. Whether you're a professional, an amateur, or a listener, come with an open heart and the open mind of a child and be happy and enjoy. Carol, I must tell you, I've not recovered from the zucchini yet. <laughs> Brother Chris uh, Geisler spoke this morning in devotions about Thanksgiving. And I'd like to say that in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I'd like to um, offer our thanks to Dr. Nola Reed Knaus and the staff at the foundation for the hard work that they have done for this festival, to Hank Naseby and the festival committee for the work that they've done. And based on what I've seen in the last two days, the hard work that you have done. And we're thankful for that. So on behalf of the board of trustees and myself, thank you.
Our epistle lesson this evening comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace, according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts that he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. And from the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. And from the Old Testament, from the book of Ezra, chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. The builders finished laying the foundation of the temple of the Lord. Then the priests, dressed in their robes, stood with their trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, stood with their cymbals. They all took their places and praised the Lord, just as David, king of Israel, had said to do. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good. His love for Israel continues forever. Then all the people shouted loudly, Praise the Lord! The foundation of the temple has been laid. But many of the older priests, Levites, and family leaders who had seen the first temple cried when they saw the foundation of this temple. Most of the other people were shouting with joy. The people made so much noise. It could, not, it could be heard far away and no one could tell the difference between the joyful shouting and the sad crying. In pondering this festival, my last as the director of the Moravian Music Foundation, Brother Riddick asked, suggested that I talk about how music relates to my Christian faith or what his experience has taught me about the role of music in the church and in the lives of the followers of Christ. That conversation was some months ago and this meditation is a partial response to that question. Jeremy Begbie is the author of Theology, Music, and Time, and a second book, Resounding Truth. They're two studies that explore music's role in creation. He proposes that the call of music is to resound God's truth in ways that hold the world enthralled and make us long for the kingdom to come. How does music fulfill that call? Or in other words, how can the practices of music and reflection on music help us think more deeply and faithfully about Jesus Christ and the central realities of our faith? 
A few things I've noted. Music doesn't just happen. It affects our lives and our thinkings. It helps people grapple with their identity and their relationships. Nicholas Cook writes that music is less a something than a way of knowing the world, a way of being ourselves. But did you ever notice in scripture music just seems to just be there? It's like gravity or weather or sunrise and sunset or water or air. People in scripture just get on with doing music. Which brought me to my next reflection. Music is an art of actions. It's music making and music hearing. It's something we do. And it's an art of connections. Connections with the physical world. The sounds we hear are physical vibrations of air that act upon the physical features of our ears. Those vibrations are caused by material objects, wire, wood, skin, lungs, vocal cords, metal, our own bodies. Music is connected with the physical world. So therefore, music is connected with all of creation. We read in Psalm 96, a new song for the Lord. Sing it and bless God's name, everyone, everywhere. Tell the whole world God's triumph day to day, God's glory, God's wonder. And lest we think the whole world means just that people do the singing. Towards the end of Psalm 96, we read, Then let the trees of the forest sing before the coming of the Lord, who comes to judge the nations, to set the earth aright, restoring the world to order. The trees of the forest will sing. In Isaiah 55, the prophet tells us, you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Yes, all creation makes music. And the music we make is just a tiny part of the music of God's creation. Music is an art of connectedness with people. One of the things that became incredibly obvious to me within a few weeks of the time I started work at the Moravian Music Foundation was that, yes, my job was related to music, but it was primarily about people. I stood in this pulpit nine years ago and said, the person is more important than the music. This is true. My brothers and sisters, my siblings in Christ, it is absolutely true. If we ever start paying more attention to the music than we are paying to the people who are making it, then we'd better have a hard look at our own hearts. You know, the epistle and gospel we just heard doesn't seem to have a whole lot to do with music, does it? Paul writes to the Christians at Ephesus that they need to conduct themselves as worthy recipients of the call of Christ with humility, gentleness, and patience. My friends, all of those attributes have to do with relationships and all have a key role in making and hearing music as followers of Jesus. Humility, which author Richard Foster defines as living as close to the truth as possible, the truth about ourselves, the truth about others, the truth about God. Gentleness towards ourselves and towards one another. And patience, again directed towards oneself and others. The person is more important than the music. What about Jesus' words in the Gospel of John? These are part of his description of himself as the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for the sheep. And lest we ever think we know who all the sheep are and therefore we know who the goats are, who's in and who's not, Jesus cautions us that he has sheep we don't even know about yet. Others that aren't part of however we define us. Sheep that may be part of the people we describe as them. Jesus doesn't really talk about music here, but have you not heard some of the most amazing musical moments from those who seem to you the least 
likely. A child who can't play in tune manages to, man, manages to come up with the most expressive turn of phrase. Someone we suspect doesn't share our faith, or at least the parts of it we think are most important, sings or plays something that makes us have to own them as a child of God, no longer someone we can consider a goat, but rather a fellow sheep in Jesus' fold. You know, the Old Testament book of Ezra isn't a book we spend a lot of time in, is it? But I find Ezra and its companion volume, Nehemiah, fascinating. The two together present the formation of the late community of Judaism following the deportation and the years of exile in Babylon. The foundations of the temple have been laid again, the temple that had been destroyed. There is a mighty celebration. There's the sound of trumpets and cymbals, festive instruments of solemn praise and joy and singing praise to God for this marvelous outcome following the years in Babylon, the years of lament where they mourned, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Now they're back in Jerusalem and the foundations of the temple have been laid. There is music and singing and shouting for joy. And there's weeping, gut-wrenching, heart-rending weeping by those who remember the glory of the former temple, which was destroyed and will never be again as they knew it. The grief and anguish of the destruction and those years of dislocation can never be forgotten, never be wiped out as if they never were. Lament and celebration happened at the same time, and the hearers could not tell which was which. That is the truth in our world. We celebrate and we lament at the same time. Sorrow and joy often go hand in hand. Some moments lean more one way, some lean more the other. Both are always there. Weeping can be a sign of both. In the new heaven and the new earth to come, the weeping and crying will be no more. God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and yes, there will be music. Just read the book of Revelation. It's not all fire and destruction. There's an incredible amount of joy and worship and praise there, and many of the words we know so well from our hymns and our liturgies come right from that worship and praise. If you came to a music festival not having any idea what you wanted to read as your devotions this week, here's your challenge. Take the book of Revelation. You'll be astounded by the wonderful worship and praise that's in there. So the music we make now can be a foretaste of what is to come. Not only what could be, but what will be. God's promise is sure. As Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, not a disembodied spirit floating around like a mist or a fog, but a body, a physical body still bearing the scars of the grievous wounds he suffered, a body to be touched and held, a body that took freshly caught fish and cooked it over an open fire and ate it with the disciples. As Jesus was raised from the dead, so shall we be with a body, a spiritual body, which doesn't mean non-physical or anti-physical, but a spiritual body, meaning a body animated by the Holy Spirit. Dear ones, our lives now in Christ are lived in joyful anticipation of that renewal. And music can play a role in that anticipation, that foretaste of the life to come. Music can help transform the life we now live, healing some of the distortions that surround us. And insofar as music brings that sort of healing, it will be a mark of the future breaking in. Music will be a foretaste of that glorious future promised in the raising of Jesus from the dead. And as such, it will be a mark of the Holy Spirit among us. We embody hope now for what will be. This very festival, then, is an act of hope. Music making, music hearing is an act of hope. And it is an act 
of remembrance. Every time you make music this week, with someone or by yourself, let it be an act of remembrance and hope. Remembrance of the saving work of Jesus Christ. Remembrance of the presence of the Spirit of Christ among us, even now, even now empowering our acts of praise. Hope that is based on the assurance of God's promises, for God keeps God's promises. Hope that is the assurance of the music to come, the music which all of creation, including each one of God's children, everyone, everywhere, shall raise to all eternity, to the glory of God the Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us make our music this week in that hope and in that deep and abiding joy. Amen. Nola's inspiring, challenging, paradoxical, and humble, as in close to the truth, words, lead us into a time when we have several opportunities to reflect on the fact that some of us are rejoicing, and some of us are still weeping, and some of us, probably many of us, are doing both. We're going to have several opportunities in the next couple of things that we will do together as part of this worship service to give us ways to think, but not only to think, but to act on that. Our offering tonight is taken so that we can give back to the community of Bethlehem. So everything that you give this evening as the ushers can come forward and take our offering will go to support mental health services here in the community of Bethlehem. With that in mind, would you pray with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks for every good and every perfect gift with which you have blessed us. You have indeed given us much. And we thank you for the opportunity that we now have to return a portion of that to you, especially so that those who cry those who hurt, those who are wondering what the way forward is, may be able to find help. Lord, we pray that you would take what we give to you tonight and that you would multiply it to help the people of Bethlehem who need your help with mental health care. Lord, take it, multiply it, apply it, and bless it. And we pray this in the name of the great healer, even Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
I was remiss in not noting that also our offering is going to support um, the Board of World Mission in its work with Ukrainian refugees. And for those of you who may not know, the Board of World Mission is actually working with our churches in Germany and in the Czech Republic who are actively providing care for Ukrainian refugees. So our, our offering tonight goes to that as well. There is no shortage of suffering in the world today. We come to a time when we remember those among our community of Moravian musicians who have gone into the more immediate presence of the Savior since our last music festival. I will share the names that we are aware of. There's a good chance that you may be aware of someone that's important to you um, that is not on our list. And you, so you see a time of prayer that follows the reading of this list of names, and I'm going to let that just be a silent prayer and invite you to lift up the names that are on your heart, um, the people that you would lift up, the families that you may know of uh, who may be still mourning the loss of loved ones. And at the appropriate time, we will hear the anthem, Blessed Are They. So when you've decided you've prayed long enough, <laughs> they will join in. I invite you to pay particular attention to those words and to the first verse of the hymn that we will sing when we enter into our communion service. Because with the Holy Christian Church, we do believe in the communion of the saints. And we believe that we are together in Christ's presence whenever we gather at Christ's table. So here are the names that I would share with you of those that we have lost, but are with the communion of the saints. Odette Adams, Diane Olson, the Reverend Dr. Glenn Asquith, Deborah Barr, Joanne Louise Barsotti, Jim Basta, James Bates, Reverend Daryl Bell, Donald Benedet, Robin Butterfield, the Reverend Dr. Bill Campbell, Robert Clark, Brown Claudfelter, the Reverend Dr. Howard H. Cox, Shirley Pete Cox, James L. Fisher, James Fortner, Sam Fort, Elaine Francis, John Geisler, Mary Heggie, Debbie Helms, Hennig Hendrickson, Eleanor Holston, Mary, pa Mary Howell, Ben Howells, Barry Hush, Richard Jones, George Kiorpus, Bruce Kleppinger, Margaret Kolb, Dale Coleman, Reba Coleman, Winifred Michael, John Muller, Chuck Nienau, Robert Nickel, Karen Palmer, Louis Phillips, Joyce Sonato, Richard Schantz, 
Helen Schultz. Jean Seibel. Mary Louisa Shade. Richard Starbuck. Robert Stewart. Mary Elizabeth Stewart. William Trevorrow. Martha Van Horn. E. Artis Weber. Connie Wester. Emma Williams. Ned Williams. Fred Wood. And Robert Zimmerman. Let us pray.
in the Moravian tradition. The Lord's table is open to all who would receive the elements. If it is your custom, wherever you regularly worship, if it is your custom to receive Holy Communion there, you are welcome to receive Holy Communion here. We will begin with serving a gluten-free wafer. And Yvette and Heather are on the sides. They will begin at the walls and work to the aisles. Melissa and Nola are in the middle. They will come to the middle and work towards the aisles. As they approach your pew, please stand to receive First, a gluten-free wafer. When your row is served, you may be seated. When we are all served, we will eat together. The same process for the cup of grape juice. When we are all served, we will drink together. In our Moravian tradition, we delight in shaking hands, extending the right hand of fellowship. Not so much tonight. <laughs> a nod, a wave, an ear hug will suffice. First, as we express our oneness in Christ, our desire to live in peace with each other, and later on, as we re commit ourselves to be messengers of love in our world. Let us prepare for communion.
grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. hearts overflow with prayers of thanksgiving as we express gratitude to God for safe travel, for renewed friendship, for the gift of music. However, on this occasion, gathering for a memorial meal, the single purpose of our prayer of thanksgiving is for the gift of God for the sins of the world. So as we pray in our hearts, as we speak to God from our hearts, as we express the depth of our gratitude, Words of St. Paul come to mind. Thanks be to God for God's indescribable gift. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
our Lord Jesus Christ said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. By your divine presence, by the holy sacraments, by all the merits of your life, sufferings, death, and resurrection. In the same way, after supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
Jesus Christ said, Drink from this, all of you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ, the Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant to us your peace. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
the Lord's countenance be lifted upon you and give you peace. We're going to celebrate love feast together and we're going to say our blessing our table grace so that we can do that in just a second um, we're going to hear from becky a b-flat chord and then we're all going to sing in unison be present at our table lord and here's where hopefully it gets interesting sopranos at the end of the first line where you see the little note there just hold that note and the altos and tenors and bass are going to continue to sing. And when you get to the end of the next line, the altos are going to hold that note. And when we get to the end of the next line, the tenors are going to hold that note. And the basses are going to finish it off. Becky's going to give us a B-flat chord. And when we're done, we're going to give her one. And then you can make your way out as we sing, Won't You Walk With Me, Jesus. So a B-flat chord, please. Be present. Enjoy your love feast. <laughs> 